So we are honored to welcome today Dr. Tejal Patel to discuss with us of treatment of Parkinson's disease with medication. Dr. Tejal Patel is an assistant clinical professor at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy and a practicing clinical pharmacist with the Memory Clinic at the Center for Family Medicine Family Health Team in Kitchener, Ontario. Dr. Patel obtained her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Kentucky and completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in neurology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Her clinical practice focuses on the pharmacotherapeutic management of neurological disorders. Her current research studies medication in older adults, in particular those presenting with cognitive impairment, impairment I'm sorry, seizures and Parkinson's disease. Dr. Patel is also involved in interdisciplinary primary care training of pharmacists for older adults with cognitive disorders. Dr. Patel has co-authored a little booklet called Medication to Treat Parkinson's Disease. It's a new resource that's just fresh off the press from Parkinson Canada. It's officially launched here today, so you're the first one to uh, get a copy of that. And we are pleased to distribute this with you today. Um, uh, uh, complimentary from uh, Parkinson Canada. They're all on the uh, Parkinson's table. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Tejal Patel. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, I'm glad to be here speaking about medications. Um, and I will welcome questions during the presentation. If you feel like you need to, me to clarify, just stop me. So what I hope to do within the next hour or so is very briefly talk about um, how Parkinson's presents in most people. And many of you here are either living with Parkinson's disease or have a loved one with Parkinson's disease, so you will be familiar with uh, many of the things that I'll say today. I also want to demystify medications. As you all know, medications are the mainstay for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So I want to give you some background about how, as clinicians, we might decide when to start medications, which medications do we decide to start with, um, and how we adjust the dosing. So I, wanna, I want to clarify some of those, demystify some of those um, uh, things that we do as people who help um, patients or persons with Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease, what is it? Uh, very many times, if you're reading up on this, what you'll see is that it is called a chronic progressive neurological disorder caused by degeneration of dopaminergic neurons. And if I were to explain what that means, essentially what it means is that it's chronic, meaning once you're diagnosed, you live with it for the remainder of your lifetime. So that defines the word chronic. You're continuously living with it. Progressive means that over time, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease tend to worsen. So as many of you living with Parkinson's will notice or will um, point out is that the symptoms may have been one or few when you first or initially got diagnosed. And then with time, they seem to progress. And so essentially what chronic progressive means for us as clinicians is it's a condition that once diagnosed, you're living with it for the rest of your lifetime, and that we should be prepared to help you manage the, the progression of the, the disease. And it's caused by the degeneration of dopaminergic neurons. And what that means is that it's caused by um, the dying off of neurons that produce a certain chemical in the brain called dopamine. Now, dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters or chemicals that is produced in the brain. And dopamine helps um, one neuron talk to another neuron, especially when it's related to producing movement. It's one of many, so there are others. There's um, acetylcholine that helps with one neuron talk to another neuron when uh, forming memories or recalling memories. 
Um, there's serotonin that helps with mood or eating. So as, as I wanted to point out, those are what dopamine is one of many. And dopamine is the chemical that is primarily responsible for producing movement. And it isn't just producing movement, it's producing fluid movement. Okay. Um, it, the disease is named after um, James Parkinson. He wrote an essay. Um, he was a physician. He lived in the 1800s. Um, and back in 1817, he wrote an essay on a group of patients that he had been seeing that had very specific symptoms that they presented with. And he was the first one to identify this group of people who presented with similar symptoms. And so the disease is named after him. There's a picture of him that I've given there. So when we think of clinical presentation of Parkinson's, we usually think of motor symptoms. Now, Parkinson's disease can have motor symptoms, so symptoms um, that are uh, more obvious when you are doing things, walking um, or resting, they impact the motor functions. There are also non-motor functions. However, um, with what we have right now in um, our healthcare system and our diagnosis, we're limited to diagnosing it when it presents with what we call classical motor symptoms. So the classical motor symptoms that a lot of people who have this disease present with are tremor. And the tremor is a very classic tremor. There's lots of different types of tremor. But the tremor that's associated with Parkinson's disease is very specific. Um, in, uh, we call it pill rolling. So many of you will tell, uh, can show us essentially what that means. It feels like you're rolling a pill. So if you have a capsule, you know, the, the tremor is like rolling a pill. So we call it pill rolling. It's an easy way for us to be able to differentiate the different types of tremor that we may see in clinical practice. Um, the tremor also has a specific frequency that we see with it. Again, different tremors can present differently. Some are very fine, um, some are very obvious. This one has a three hertz frequency. It's a way for us to be able to start differentiating it from other tremors that can present with other problems or other um, conditions in the brain. So it's a pill rolling tremor, it, pres it has a certain frequency, and the other thing that we notice is that it occurs at rest. There are some tremors that occur when you go to initiate a movement. Say you wanted to drink your cup of coffee. As you initiate the movement, your tremor occurs. In Parkinson's disease, what we noticed is that the tremor occurs when you're resting. And when you try to do something or as you initiate movement, the tremor disappears. Again, it's a way for us as clinicians to start to piece all of this information together to figure out where this, all of these coalition of symptoms can be slotted in terms of a disease process. And lastly, what we notice with this is that it usually starts with one side of the body not both sides. So if someone presents with tremors on both sides, they may not, they may not, it's not that it's obvious, they may not be as likely to have Parkinson's as opposed to if you at um, your initial point present with symptoms on one side of the body. So we call that asymmetrical. It doesn't have symmetry, it's asymmetrical, occurs with one side. Now with time, as I noticed, uh, as I pointed out earlier, with Parkinson's disease, it does progress. So very many persons with Parkinson's, their symptoms will progress to the other side, but it occurs over time. Initially, you might see the tremor, the rigidity, the uh, um, uh, decreased movement on one side, and then it might progress over to the other. It could start with one, what we say extremity, and what we mean by extremity is a hand or a, or, um, or a leg, and then progress over to the other side. Um, what we also see is rigidity. Um, what patients may say, it's very difficult to get out of bed, or persons with Parkinson's may say, it's difficult to get out of bed. I'm not as fluid in the morning or fluid during the day as I used to be. Um, and uh, as we get older, we sometimes tend to think, oh, it's age, but sometimes those are the things that sh um, help us recognize that this is the beginning of a process. 
Um, the third thing that is uh, that we look for when we're trying to diagnose Parkinson's or when doctors are trying to diagnose Parkinson's is something called bradykinesia, which is just decreased movement. You're not walking as fast as you used to. Um, you know, you you can't get up and go as much as you used to. Um, and we also sometimes find akinesia. Now, akinesia is complete loss of movement and occurs um, uh, further down the road and usually during the initial phases we're looking for bradykinesia. Now many of you, if, if you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's, I'm sure you had to do a number of things when you were visiting your physician or your neurologist. They probably had you write sentences multiple times. They probably had you draw a circle. And if you're wondering why they're making you do those things, it's to be able to see if you have bradykinesia. So your handwriting, when you write the first time you write the sentence, it'll likely be bigger than as you write it repeatedly. Your, spell, your sentences get smaller and smaller. The amplitude or the size of your letters get smaller and smaller. And that helps us recognize bradykinesia. When you draw your circles, they're looking for those um, little um, uh, squiggles, but they're also looking to see if your circles are getting smaller and smaller as you're drawing them. We also look at your face to see, are you blinking as often as someone without Parkinson's blinks? Because we also know that your blinking decreases when you have Parkinson's disease. And we may also be looking at your face to see, can you express your emotions as easily as someone who doesn't have Parkinson's? Um, I'm sure family members of people who have Parkinson's have told you it's not easy to see what you're thinking because the ability to express what you're thinking and your emotions decreases. And that is all happens because of a loss of dopamine that you need to produce the muscular movement in your face. So it's a similar um, uh, thought process in terms of dopamine's effect on the motor uh, skills. And finally, what we may also look for is postural instability. We may pull you backwards and see if you can stop yourself from walking backwards. Or we may um, ask for falls or dizziness. Now, postural instability basically means you're not as stable as you're standing, um, essentially occurs later on in the disease process and it isn't, it isn't a finding that you find early in the process. These are the things we're looking for. Usually you need two out of three to be able to diagnose Parkinson's disease. And so if, if that kind of explains some of the things that your physicians may have done when you were visiting them. Okay. Now, there's also something called non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now, non-motor symptoms essentially is exactly as it says. Those are symptoms that are not motor related or movement related. And they may occur or may start years before you're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. A, a big example is um, the loss of smell. That may start 10, 15 years before you're diagnosed with Parkinson's. And we've begun to recognize that almost 25, one out of four to almost four out of four different studies report different numbers may have the symptom. Um, and so we're trying to understand if that's a way we can recognize Parkinson's even earlier. It's still in its research. It's not applied in clinic, um, clinical diagnosis uh, as much right now. But we've recognized that the loss of smell may predate your motor symptoms. Um, and so that may be one way to, to um, uh, examine and determine people who have Parkinson's. Other things that uh, persons with Parkinson's will report is fatigue or tiredness. Many of you will talk about how tire, tiring it is and how tired you get through the day. Um, a number of people will also talk about uh, mood issues, so depression, anxiety, and sometimes anxiety is related to the motor symptoms and being able to control the motor symptoms. But we've realized that depression sometimes also predates or can also um, occur with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease because it is a life-altering diagnosis. 
very many times, many people will also report something called REM behavior or REM sleep behavior disorder. So problems with, um, uh, they may say things about having to walk at night and, and being restless at night or kicking their partners. They may not recognize their par they're kicking their partners, but their partners will report. He's, he kicks me at night or he, she kicks me at night. So that also we've discovered that there is some relationship between Parkinson's disease and those kind of um, uh, sleep disorders. Um, we're recognizing more and more that there is a relationship that we need to investigate further. And finally, a lot of patients may have been reporting constipation, predating their motor symptoms, but nobody's thought about putting it together because as we all know, constipation can occur for a number of reasons. But again, we've realized that some of these symptoms may start presenting even before you see the motor symptoms present. And so that we need to pay attention to those kind of clinical symptoms as well. Now, as a pharmacist, I was taught to always look um, when a person comes to me and complains of a symptom, whatever it is, I was taught to always look at their medication list to see if it's medication related. And so with Parkinson's disease, there are a, hu it's a huge list of drugs, and I don't expect you to go away remembering it all, but as just a way to show you that there are medications that can produce the same symptoms as Parkinson's disease. We call this drug-induced Parkinson's disease. So anytime you have a symptom, it's always a great point to sit down with your physician or your pharmacist and say, is there a medication on this list that could be responsible for this symptom? And really, it's not only for Parkinson's, it's for any new symptom. I'd recommend that you sit down with your physician or pharmacist and say, can you look at the medications I'm taking to see if any of those can cause the symptom I'm having? It's always a good idea to ask that question because um, in people with Parkinson's, um, sometimes use of these drugs uh, unmasks, what we say unmasks underlying Parkinson's. So these people have Parkinson's disease process underlying and ongoing that we haven't recognized because it hasn't presented as a motor symptom. And once people take, especially the drugs listed in the high risk column, then those symptoms become prevalent and then we recognize, oh, this person has Parkinson's. But in some people, they don't have a Parkinson's disease process and these drug produces those symptoms. So if we don't recognize that it's a drug causing the disease and then we treat the disease, then that's a double whammy. You're on two drugs you may not need. Now, you must never stop any of the medications if you think they're related because some of these cannot be stopped suddenly. They'll produce what we call rebound or a problem that we hadn't recognized would happen if you suddenly stopped. So if you think that there is a medication that's related before you stop it, always talk to your doctor. If um, it, it is thought to be related, then they will help you figure out how to come off of it slowly but never stop anything suddenly unless you feel like it's going to harm your life. I always say make a, a, an appointment with your doctor or even better, your pharmacist. You can walk up to the counter and say, I'm having this. What do you think about this? What do you think I should do? Okay. So what about starting treatment? How do we decide when to start treatment? Um, how do we decide why? Um, so when we are looking at starting treatment, and when I say treatment, I mean specifically drug treatment for Parkinson's disease. As we know, there are other strategies we can use to ameliorate or lessen the symptoms of Parkinson's disease that are not drug related. But what time or when do we start treatment for Parkinson's disease? There is no perfect time. There is no magic time when your doctor says, this is it for you. We've, you've reached that point. It has to be done in a shared decision-making process. And what I mean by that is you have to be party to that decision. And usually what we find is persons who have Parkinson's decide the time for starting a drug treatment is when it starts impacting their quality of life. 
So if someone feels like it's causing their tremor or their rigidity or their clumsiness related to motor symptoms is causing them social embarrassment or is impacting the kind of work they do and their ability to continue working. Um, if those are the points at which we usually start treatment. Um, and which medication we start, again, there is no magic drug that we start with. It all depends on how severe your symptoms are, how much they're impacting you, um, what type of symptoms you're presenting with. You know, of all those four different types I, I listed earlier on, sometimes the treatment is based on which of those are your predominant or primary um, problematic symptom. Um, and also, an important thing to remember is the age. Some of those medications are not appropriate for the older adults. And as we age, they cause more problems than they cause other symptoms that need to be treated. Um, and they may be uh, less um, uh, adverse effect causing in a younger population. So when you're sitting with your physician, they're thinking of those things in terms of what kind of symptoms, how bad are those symptoms, how badly are they affecting this person, how old are they, are they a robust, healthy, you know, marathon running 80 year old, or are they more a frail 60 year old? That will determine which option they may decide to present to you as an option to start. It's always a good idea to go in well equipped with information so that you can talk about all of these options. And I hope that some of this will help you um, get that uh, background to be able to chat with your physicians. Now there are about seven different classes that I've listed. Um, we call them by their activity. So what they do in the brain is usually how we label drugs. The first class I've listed there are monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. There's two on the market for that. There's selegiline and resagiline, which is also called Azelect. Then we also have anticholinergics, Artane and Cogentin. Now these medications are very problematic. And the evidence or the quality of evidence supporting their use in Parkinson's is not very good. But we used to use it and some people found it effective. So we still keep it in our armamentarium box, our box of weapons to, to address this. Um, but there, as you age, they cause more problems. So they're not used as often these days. Then there is a class called dopamine agonists that kind of pretend to be like dopamine, but they're not really dopamine. Then we have a class called the dopamine precursors, and you, most of you will be familiar with this class. We use this in almost all persons with Parkinson's at some point in their life journey with Parkinson's, and that's levodopa, cinnamet or prolopa. At some point, you will be using that medication. Then we have others called catechol or methyl transferase inhibitors. And we purposely make these really mouthful so that nobody can say them and you have to go to pharmacy school for four years to learn to say them. Um, the one on the market that we use frequently is Compton. Then there are the N-methyl NMDA um, antagonists. I won't even attempt to say that. Um, and then we have some combination products where they've combined different um, mechanisms of action or different ways the drugs work into one pill. So you don't have to take as many pills. You get all drugs in that one pill. Now, what do these medications do? How do they work? So we've targeted, targeted several different areas. And this looks like a complex um, slide, so I'm going to break it down for you. It's uh, and try to provide some clarity. So if you look at the straight line on the screen, the, the line going down, that's called your blood-brain barrier. It's a thin line of um, cells that protects your brain. And outside of your brain, um, there is dopamine. So dopamine exists inside and outside of your brain, but dopamine cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So when it exists outside the brain, it has no way of going into the brain. And we need, as, as I mentioned with Parkinson's, it's the dopaminergic neurons that are dying off, and we need more dopamine to keep us moving fluidly. 
So as they're dying off, there's less dopamine being produced. So how do we get the dopamine outside of the brain into the brain if the blood-brain barrier won't allow to get in? Now, what it does, what the blood-brain barrier does allow, uh, the brain, uh, allow to get into the brain is something called levodopa. And levodopa is the chemical substrate before the dopamine. It actually gets broken down into dopamine. And the brain will allow levodopa to get into the brain. Now, as you all know, you all, as many of you know, you take levodopa. Now, levodopa, when you take it, um, it gets broken down really fast into dopamine. And it can cause side effects such as nausea. That's the, the, the levodopa being broken down into dopamine. So the reason that you have products such as Cinemet and Prolopa is they're both combination products. Prolopa is with a product called uh, benzacyride, and Cinemet is levodopa combined with carbidopa. And the reason we put those in with the levodopa is because they stop the breakdown of levodopa. So if you can stop the breakdown of levodopa outside of the brain, then you allow more levodopa to get into the brain, and then the levodopa can get broken down into dopamine, and therefore you have dopamine that can help with activity and uh, motor activity. So both carbidopa and benzacyride, we call them dopa decarboxylase inhibitors, they stop the enzyme that breaks down the dopamine uh, or that breaks down the levodopa into dopamine. Um, the entacapone intac does a similar activity as well, so that more levodopa can cross the blood-brain barrier. Once levodopa is in the brain, so that will be on the right side of your screen there, um, it gets broken down into dopamine and then other, um, uh, other metabolites, we call them. Um, it, once it's broken down into dopamine, it can get further broken down. So you don't want dopamine to get even broken down even further. So that's where selegiline and resagiline come in. They stop the dopamine in the brain from being broken down. So you have more dopamine floating and useful. Okay. And finally, on the other end, so if the top uh, parallelogram is your presynaptic neuron, is your neuron that's trying to talk to the postsynaptic neurons. So at the bottom on your right hand side is the parallelogram that's a postsynaptic uh, neuron. I don't even know if it's a parallelogram. I might be using the wrong term, but I think you know what I'm saying. Um, you want to get the dopamine from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron so that you're able to produce a movement. Okay, so you want the dopamine, your dopamine is actually the communicating agent between your presynaptic and your postsynaptic. And the dopamine agonists actually pretend to be dopamine. And they sit on the gates on the postsynaptic neuron, telling the postsynaptic neuron, hey, I'm dopamine, send my message, when they're not actually dopamine. Does that, is that clear? Yes? Okay. So, as I mentioned, um, when we're thinking of starting treatment, we look at severity. So we usually try to, the questions that a physician may ask you is, you know, how are your symptoms affecting your life on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, do you find them mild? Do you find them severe? What is it about the symptom that's preventing you from carrying out your day-to-day -day activities? How's the tremor affecting you? How's the slowness or the rigidity affecting you? And then finally, as I mentioned, we also look at the age um, to see if the person sitting in front of us is going to be able to tolerate the medication that we're starting, because all medications have side effects. Okay. So when we think of um, age, 60 and older, if you have um, Mild bradykinesia, or if you have mild postural uh, instability, we may go with a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. That's how we might start treatment. So if we think the symptoms are mild, and we want to keep the other drugs in our toolbox for later on, let's start with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It has few side effects, it's tolerated very well, it'll keep the mild symptoms at bay, up to a point where we might need to use one of the bigger guns in the toolbox. Um, if you have severe symptoms, severe bradykinesia, postural instability, or tremor, then we will go with one of the big guns, which is levodopa. 
and levodopa is um, very effective in treating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, as you all very uh, well know. If you're younger than 60 years old, then we have a few other options available. So if you have tremor as your predominant or your most um, uh, problematic symptom, uh, we might go with a dopamine agonist or levodopa. And most clinicians will usually go with the dopamine agonist as opposed to levodopa. Now, I've listed anticholinergics there because in some people, the use of an anticholinergic is very effective in treating that tremor. However, as we age, we find that anticholinergics do start affecting um, ability to remember. They cause uh, memory impairment. They cause constipation. Um, they cause dry mouth. So we might limit that. If you have, if you're younger than 60 and you have mild symptoms, again, you see that the monoamine oxidase B inhibitor is the first agent that we would try. If you have severe symptoms, then we're going to target one of the bigger guns, dopamine agonists or levodopa. And the reason we have that, in, in the age is really an arbitrary cutoff. For each clinician, they may use a different age or they may truly just look at the person sitting in front of them to decide which way they should go. With dopamine agonists, if you use it in older people, they have a higher rate of producing symptoms such as hallucinations or sudden sleep or um, uh, orthostatic hypotension, which is a sudden drop in your blood pressure. And that's why we try to tend to use them in the younger population as opposed to older. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't use them at all. We just, in the older population, we just have to be more cautious and do more monitoring if we use those agents in the older population. Yes. Dopamine agonists. So anything that um, has an effect on dopamine, they all have similar side effects because it's the dopamine that's related um, in the blood pressure, in the hallucinations, in the sudden sleep. So they all carry the risk, but dopamine agonists um, appear to carry a higher risk. And so we try to limit their use in, in the older population. And as you will also know that we also try to adjust treatment for Parkinson's disease and we are continuously doing this as we go through, the, um, go through our life with Parkinson's. Um, if we give an um, agent and it's not effective and it um, causes no side effects, we just tend to continue. And we don't want to rock a boat that's sailing. It's the point at which we start seeing side effects or we see that it's not as effective that we start thinking of strategies about how to adjust dosing. And again, there is no magic form formula. There is no algorithm that works for everybody. For each person, a different um, combination of things is going to work. So adjustment is going to be based very much on the person that's sitting in front of you as a clinician. So if you started um, on an anticholinergic, we might add a dopamine agonist. Um, if this results in good control, always, I'm a, I'm a believer in using as few medications as you can, because the more medications you use, the higher the number of drug interactions, et cetera, et cetera, the higher potential for side effects. So if a dopamine agonist is working, that's a good point to sit down. Never do it by, by yourself, but to sit down and discuss whether you should come off your anticholinergic, whether that is a potential um, or that's where we're going to move towards. If this does not work, we might change to levodopa. So sometimes you might feel like we're doing a lot of changes, but truly what we're trying to do is find the medication that works best for you. And we have some ideas about which type of patients they may work for, but it doesn't work 100% of the time. So really, with every person, we're trying to figure out which works best for them. Um, if you started on a dopamine agonist, you'll see that we moved to one of the other agents, levodopa or an anticholinergic. And if you started with levodopa, usually if you start with levodopa, we don't tend to discontinue that because we know that that will be required long term. We usually try to add other agents. We might decrease the dose of levodopa <laughs> while we're adding other agents. But generally, once you're on levodopa, it's very difficult to come off of levodopa. And so we try to um, prolong the time to starting levodopa with the other agents. 
Um, and similarly, with the other symptoms, with age, again, it's either um, looking to see what you're on and then trying one of the other agents. And we'll usually start at a small dose and then try to target a dose that affects you best. So affects your motor control without side effects. So it's usually, um, uh, it's like a, a, a thing, um, what's the right terminology? It, it's, um, I'm skipping out on words. Um, it, it's a trial and error for every person to try to see which dose might work best for them. So um, as I mentioned, adverse effects of dopaminergic agents are related to the dopamine. Um, over time, what we do see with levodopa is something that we call motor complications. So you might see fluctuations in how your dose of levodopa is working. Okay? Um, it may wear off earlier than it used to. Very many people will say that it doesn't last as long as it used to. It used to last four hours, or it used to last six hours, and now it's lasting three hours or five hours. So that is something that happens with levodopa. We also see uh, dyskinesias. So if you think of um, uh, water running over a turbine, you need the right rate of water over, running over the turbine so the turbine flows smoothly. If you increase the amount of water and the pressure running over the turbine, the turbine might spin too fast. So similarly, sometimes there is too much dopamine and it might cause dyskinesias. And so we've got to um, ensure that we're dosing and adjusting dosing so you don't have dyskinesias, but you still have uh, motor control and fluidity in your movements. Um, we've also seen um, impulse control disorders, and I'll talk about that, with dopaminergic agents. And then I also mentioned nausea that occurs when you take a dose, as well as hallucinations that can um, present at any age but um, it, it can present um, in the older uh, persons. Now, when we talk about motor complications, I mentioned on period. You might hear a lot of clinicians asking, when are you on? And essentially what they're asking is, you know, when you have complete control of your movement and when your movements are fluid. Then there's the off period. Those are the times when you see that the medication is not working as well and that the effect of the medication is diminished. Your movement is not as fluid. You're seeing a return of your Parkinsonian symptoms, such as tremor, rigidity, um, bradykinesia. Motor fluctuations are fluctuations with your on and off. It's those times when you start seeing that the effect of the drug doesn't last as long as it used to, or that um, you're having dyskinesias in between when you're taking your doses. And dyskinesias, as uh, most of you will be aware with, are, those are movements you can't control. So you have movements you can control, and then you might have other movements that you can't control, um, especially when it's, um, uh, it's, they're non-rhythmic, they're jerky movements. Okay? And then, of course, when I refer to impulse control disorders, I'm actually talking about um, these agents increasing the risk of uncontrolled gambling, uncontrolled eating, um, or compulsive shopping. We've seen those kind of things also happen with dopaminergic agents. So in terms of how do we address this, so really the, the treatment of Parkinson's disease is very much how to keep you um, in your fluid state, good motor control without having side effects. So when we see these side effects, what are the thought processes that we have in terms of treating this? So the first is if you uh, are given a dose of cinnamon and you pr have no effect, it doesn't address your symptoms at all, then we're going to question the diagnosis. Uh, cinnamon is very effective for Parkinson's, but the symptoms that look Parkinsonian don't only occur with Parkinson's disease. There are a whole host of other conditions that are also related to Parkinsonian symptoms, and sometimes in some people it's very difficult to clearly understand what it's related to from a clinical perspective. So if cinnamon doesn't work, we're going to start investigating whether it's one of those other conditions. And we have no magic test, no scan, no blood test that tells us, yes, this person has Parkinson's disease. So sometimes we are working um, with the information that we have trying to make a decision based on how the information is presented. 
if you see that your response is there, you have some response, but it's not the response that you're looking for. So you've seen some improvement in your motor symptoms, but not the level at which you were hoping to achieve. Then you can talk to your doctors about if you're on levodopa, how to increase that dose, how to um, increase the frequency. Um, uh, if you're on one of the agents, which of the other agents you should try adding so that those um, problems can be addressed. In terms of delayed on, I'll, I'll hear a lot of persons with Parkinson's tell me it used to work straight away, but now it takes an hour or two to start working. And that may be because the, the pill is not moving as fast through your gut. And so it's not getting to that point where it's dissolved and absorbed as fast as it used to a couple of years ago. Um, so, or it may be that you may be eating more protein. And so um, protein kind of interacts with dopamine and doesn't let the dopamine, levodopa get um, absorbed. And so you're having, you're not seeing the effect that you used to because it's taking longer to get absorbed. Okay. Um, so some of the options we might think of is increasing the dopa, do, the, the dose of the drug or the um, uh, frequency, so changing the time of administration. Um, one thing I always tell persons with Parkinson's as well as some of the physicians I work with is try to limit the use of the controlled release formulation. What we've seen in studies is that the absorption of that formulation is very erratic from one person to the next and from one dose to the next. Sometimes a person may see a, an effect immediately and sometimes it takes hours. And so the absorption of that formulation is very, very um, difficult to, to pin down. So I try to limit the use of that formulation to only at bedtime so that you have some dopamine when you're waking up to be able to get moving and take your next dose. And that's the only place that I see um, that formulation's uh, good use. Um, dosing on an empty stomach, so you know, making sure that you're an hour, an hour and a half away from any meals that you've had heavy in protein. Some of the people that I work with who have Parkinson's tell me swear by taking their medications with a carbonated drink. So with Coke or Sprite, they say it increases the uh, uh, the time, uh, not increases, it decreases the time to when it starts working. Yes. one to one and a half hours. So if you've had a meal with a, a protein rich meal, rich meal, then I would wait um, one and a half hours or so before taking my pills. So you've gotta, if you have to take your pills at certain times, then you have to plan your meals around those times in terms of when you're going to have something that's a protein snack related to when you need your dose. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Someone asked a question, could you repeat it? Oh. You can't hear, and my apologies. So the question was, um, when, if I could restate what I had just stated about protein and separating the dose from the protein snack. Yes. What could it be about a carbonated soft drink that would increase the absorption rate? So the question is, what is it about the carbonated soft drink that increases the absorption rate? I'm not certain. Probably has to do um, with most of the carbonated drinks have some acidity to them. So I'm thinking that it actually has to do with the pH balance in your um, gut or your stomach. But I, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. But I've heard that it helps. Yes. And I also said they're welcome to ask me questions, so I'll continue on. So in terms of wearing off or end of dose uh, phenomena, when you come across that, again, talk to your doctors about adjusting the dose of levodopa, so increasing the dose if there's no dyskinesias, or increasing the frequency of administration if you see dyskinesias, um, but decreasing the dose. So essentially, you might be taking doses um, sooner, but you might be taking less of the dose so that you don't have dyskinesias. And dyskinesias usually occur when the dopamine goes a bit too high. 
Um, if you have wearing off at the beginning of the day, so you're, you're waking up with your symptoms, it might benefit you to take a controlled release formulation at the point when you go to bed so that there is some dopamine remaining in your body when you're waking up so that you can get moving. Some people have to get up at night to take a dose so that they're able to get up and get moving in the day. Um, adding a dopamine agonist, if you're not on a dopamine agonist, um, again, once you achieve a good dose, it's always a good idea to uh, decrease the dose of the medication you were on before to see if there's lower doses that can help you with your symptom control and you're not taking high doses of both medications. Again, requires some discussion with your clinician so that you can decide how to do that and at which point your treatment is uh, your symptoms are controlled best. Um, adding a Compton inhibitor, if you do that, then uh, as a pharmacist, I always talk about adjusting the dose of levodopa because sometimes that might be too much dopamine. So we always talk about how uh, much to decrease the levodopa dose by if you're adding a Compton inhibitor. Um, and again, adding a monoamine oxidase inhibitor is always also an option. Um, persons with Parkinson's may also experience something called freezing. This is also another motor complication, and it can happen with any movement. Um, thankfully, it usually lasts a few seconds to a few minutes, but in some people it can be a problematic issue. Um, sometimes it helps to adjust the dose of levodopa, and it may be related to not enough dopamine in the brain. Um, and then there are people who've told me that sometimes putting cues on the ground, so if they're having problem walking, putting a cane or a line helps the movement um, initiate. Um, so sometimes working with your occupational therapist um, or your physical therapist to find those magic things that may work for you may also be um, a, a good idea. Um, since I'm almost right out, out of time. So motor complications, dyskinesias. If you have um, just recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, then maybe we just need to adjust the dose of levodopa. Uh, I'll finish off and then I'll get to you. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna try to get uh, finished with this. With advanced disease, it's difficult to manage, as many of you may know, because it requires some very, very, very fine tuning of the levodopa and your other medications so that you have smooth control but it doesn't push you over into too much dopamine and dyskinesias. So again, reducing the dose of levodopa, reducing it and adding a dopamine agonist, um, using a CR formula. If, if you're using a CR formulation to move to an um, immediate release formulation, adding Compton inhibitors or monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, and then finally, what we may also consider is adding amantadine. And amantadine, this is a point where we actually see its best effectiveness is at the point of dyskinesias. Um, I've listed some uh, thoughts about what to do if uh, one experiences hallucinations or constipation or orthostatic hypotension. With hallucinations, um, if they're mild symptoms, we may opt not to do anything. I once was working with a person who had Parkinson's and her hallucination was seeing her teenage daughters at the dining table. And so we opted not to treat that hallucination because it was not a problematic issue. But in, in some patients it may be, some persons it may be a problematic issue um, and it may need to be treated, especially if it's, um, if it causes them anxiety or if it um, uh, causes fear. Uh, in that case, what we're generally trying to do, we don't want to uh, start adjusting Parkinson's medication straight away, especially if they're controlling movement. So we may look at other medications and see if there are other medications that may be um, impacting those hallucinations. So for example, sometimes anticholinergic medications, sometimes beta blockers. Now there's specific beta blockers that we use for um, the heart that sometimes produce hallucinations. So that, from that perspective, a pharmacist will approach those and say, which of these can we manipulate, maybe reduce the dose to uh, ameliorate some of the symptoms of um, hallucinations. Again, discussing all of this with your doctor. Constipation, um, the non-medication uh, route is best, increasing fiber, increasing fluid intake, improving physical activity. If you're on medications that are anticholinergic, reducing the dose or discontinuing them. 
um, and then discussing treatment options with stool softeners, laxatives, etc., with your physician. And finally, sometimes we may even use domperidone. I see a, a lot of use for domperidone to improve constipation and to improve the transit time for food in persons with Parkinson's. If you have, um, or if you're experiencing orthostatic hypotension, and what I mean by that is sudden drops in your blood pressure, where when you're going from a, a sleeping to a sitting position or sitting to a standing, you get dizzy and unstable. That can occur not only with medications used to treat Parkinson's, but with Parkinson's itself. So again, then we were looking at, are you on any medications to treat blood pressure? Maybe that's, an, that's something that we can fix. Decrease those doses or decrease those medications so they don't cause as much of an impact. We're also going to look to see, are you drinking enough fluids? Do you have salt, enough salt in your diet? It's the only place where we, as professionals, will say increase the salt intake. <laughs> Most of the time you've heard in your life, decrease the salt intake. But, um, and there are some other options I've listed, avoiding large meals, avoiding alcohol, um, avoiding warm areas, um, elevating the head of your bed so that you're not lying flat on the bed, um, and then moving slowly from whichever position you're on. So do, doing things with thought and with care. And if all of those fail, then there are some medications that we can use, uh, usually fludrocortisone or midodrine for treating that. And some additional factors to consider, nausea. Um, advise, we usually advise people to take the, the pill with a non-protein snack so that the nausea is limited if it occurs. Um, always, as I mentioned earlier, separating your protein from your doses or taking it with a carbonated drink. Um, never stop your medications suddenly. Always discuss with your doctor and they'll tell you how to taper, or your pharmacist, they'll tell you how to stop it slowly. Uh, with the brain, uh, uh, any medication that affects the brain, it's very important that we do things slowly. Start at a small dose and slowly increase, and then, I'm almost done, and then um, slowly come off of those medications as well. It's very important to remember to do that. Um, and then finally, there are some drug interactions that I wanted to uh, point out to you. Some of these, because they're available over the counter, you can go and pick them up and you've not had a chance to chat with somebody, then you may not know that they're interacting with your medications. For example, antacids, because they decrease the absorption. And when I say bioavailability, is the amount of drug in your body. So always before you decide to take an antacid, if you have a medication list, walk up to the pharmacist at the counter and say, is this going to be a problem? Okay. And there's too many of those for me to be able to go through all of them. Anticholinergic medications is a class, but there's lots of medications within that class. So for example, um, uh, medications that you can find over the counter, like Benadryl is a huge anticholinergic. Um, medications such as Elevil or amitriptyline or nortriptyline that we use to treat sleeping issues, they also have anticholinergic effects. So um, it's, again, too large a list to mention all of them. Uh, talk to your doctor or your pharmacist about those potential side effects. Antihypertensive medications, when we're younger, most of us will get diagnosed with a blood pressure or hypertension and we'll get placed on medications. And then as we age, um, our blood pressure either isn't as elevated um, or starts to fall. So we need to, especially with Parkinson's disease, we need to think about whether we need to continue those medications as well. Um, Antipsychotics uh, and metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is also used to promote GI motility or you know transit time within the gut, but that one has a big effect on dopamine. We call those anti-dopamine or dopamine antagonists, and they actually block the dopamine receptors in in the brain and cause symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease. And most almost all antipsychotics do that too. So again, we need to think about that. Um, when we're thinking about Parkinson's uh, medications. And anything that contains iron will decrease the absorption of Parkinson's medications so, or levodopa. So again, 
if the, the message I can send away is take your medication lists, everything you're taking, herbal products, over-the-counter prescription, to your physician or your pharmacist and make sure that there is no interaction that's affecting the control of your Parkinson's or anything else. And I believe that is it. And I can open it up for questions. Thank you very much. I just want to say we have about a 10 minute question period so you can raise your hand and someone will come with the microphone. And I would ask that after the question period, please remain seated. We will do a rapid lunchbox distribution so we know how many is needed. Please remain at your seat. You'll receive a lunchbox and then you're free to roam and go and meet the exhibitors, go to the washroom, grab coffee in the hall if you wish. So it should be a uh, fast i will call all volunteers and staff to uh distribute the lunch boxes so now raise your hand for questions thank you um well i i was put on cinemet mm -hmm. and um when i was on three milligrams like um um uh three tablets the, um, with each meal my blood pressure would drop and would, i would collapse mm -hmm. so my neurologist brought me down to two and a half milligrams so I wouldn't pass out. Mm -hmm. Now, falling asleep, is that caused by Parkinson's or the medication Cinemet? Um, so it could be related to both. It has also been related to the medications that you use to treat Parkinson's. We've definitely seen sudden sleep associated with dopamine agonists. Those two, that connection has been made. Um, sleeping, uh, falling asleep, um, having sleeping problems is also associated with Parkinson's as well. So very many times it's very difficult with Parkinson's disease as well as Parkinson's medications to truly say it's one and not the other. Very many times, it's probably a correlation between the two. So I shouldn't be surprised that if I'm at a lecture or I'm um, sitting, let's say, in synagogue, and I like uh, nod off, um, if I have Parkinson's or taking cinnamon, I should not be surprised this is happening. No, you should not be surprised. Uh, but you should mention it to your doctor because if it's a problem and you really want to pay attention to um, what's going on, then there might be something that he can do in terms of adjusting your dose. But I, also am taking, what I is just want to add a little something that may help you answer all of your questions. A year ago in this very room, we had a whole conference on sleep disorders, sleep problems in Parkinson's. It was taped and it's available on YouTube. If you go on YouTube, you can prompt Parkinson, Dr. Pastuma, or Parkinson sleep disorder. It's a one hour conference, very comprehensive, specifically on that topic. So maybe that could help you because I would uh, suggest we maybe give uh, the microphone to others. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, could, could you explain again uh, very quickly about anticholinergics anti yes. and, and what you said about that? And the other question is having to do with proteins and medication. Um, I, I didn't quite, so eggs are out kind of thing? Um, okay, so the first question is, uh, I assume, what are anticholinergics and how they affect uh, a person, an older person? So um, anticholinergics are, it's, it's a very broad term. We give uh, a number of drugs, um, and they can be drugs such as antidepressants. They can be medications used for sleep. They can be medications used for anxiety, for nausea. Um, and the reason we call them anticholinergics is because they work on the cholinergic system, on the acetylcholine system in the, in the body. Um, and when you block some of those acetylcholine receptors, you produce things such as constipation, um, dry mouth, dry um, eyes, but the most important, we feel, is also uh, memory impairment. So acetylcholine is like dopamine, it's a neurotransmitter, it's the chemical that's responsible for us to be able to create memories, to be able to remember, and when we block that receptor with an anticholinergic, we're not able to form those memories. 
And so there is a number of drugs out uh, as over-the-counter medications as well as prescribed medications that have that effect. And sometimes we don't recognize it straight off that they have that effect. We actually have to look at how it works to be able to determine that. And that's why um, it's, a, it's a very long list. And even within those anticholinergic medications, there are ones that are low anticholinergic and there are ones that are high anticholinergic. So for example, Benadryl, I'd put it as a high anticholinergic. But something like Celexa has very low anticholinergic. So it's just that um, they can become problematic you, a person does not want to have Parkinson's and then start having memory issues related to a drug so, or constipation when they already have that as an underlying um, thing that happens with Parkinson's. Now your second question uh, as related to protein is that protein decreases how um, levodopa is uh, absorbed. So what it does is it doesn't decrease the amount that it's absorbed, but it, it increases the time within which it gets absorbed. So you don't see as much levodopa straight after you take it if you take it with protein as you would if you didn't take it with protein. So ultimately you might have the same amount of levodopa over time, but then you don't reach that peak or the, the amount that you need for it to produce an effect in the, frame that you, in the time frame that you need to. Does that answer your question? So eggs are not out. You just need to separate it. I just want to add, as uh, shown in your handout, that there will be a webinar specifically on nutrition and Parkinson's. And such issues will be addressed. It's going to be on May 11th. You can go on Parkinson's website and register, and also we'll address a bit of protein intake and drug interaction in the panel this afternoon. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, over here, if I may. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I've seen, I work with folks with Parkinson's, and I've seen several folks that have difficulty sequencing events. Um, is there a, is there a treatment for that? Is that drug related? Do you know? Okay, so you're talking about sequencing as in memory. I so executive function? Yes. Yes. So uh, Parkinson's um, disease over time, there's something called Parkinson's related dementia that occurs and it occurs after several years of having Parkinson's. Um, there may also be other um, spectrum of disorders called Lewy body disorders, and they all fall under memory problems. So executive function or sequencing acts fall under memory problems. And um, it can be related to a medication if they're on a medication such as an anticholinergic, but it can also be related to having Parkinson's or having a Lewy body spectrum. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Hello. Yes. Um, you didn't mention the new pro patch. Yes. Is that uh, one already included in the types, sir? So new pro patch, um, I have it as one of the drugs in my slides is a dopamine agonist. So it's like your Pramipexol and your Ropinerol. Um, it's formulated in a patch, so you don't have to take pills, and you leave the patch on either, um, um, you can place it in several different areas of the body for 24 hours. It works very much like other dopamine agonists, such as Pramipexol and um, uh, Ropinerol. Um, it also has to be adjusted, so the patches come in different strengths, and you'll have to go up, and if you're coming off of it, you have to go down. Hi there. Um, if you take domperidol and reduce constipation, can that increase dyskinesias? Um, domperidone, not necessarily, because it does not get into the brain. It you, uh, only works peripherally or outside of the brain. So you should not see an increase in dyskinesias. What may be happening is that more of the levodopa is getting absorbed because you're improving transit time, and that's related to the dyskinesias. So it might dis involve a discussion with your physician about how to adjust. Yes. What is the situation on, on research on, on medical marijuana with respect to medication? Yeah. 
So research is ongoing. I don't believe that we've reached a firm conclusion on its effect in terms of marijuana and the effect on Parkinson's disease as in symptom control of Parkinson's. There is some research that it may help with pain, but um, I actually don't know enough about how it helps with pain to be able to conclusively tell you how effective it is. And is there a seminar? Yeah, I just want to add that um, there's been recently a webinar exactly on that topic. Parkinson Canada invited a young expert on all different issues of Parkinson's med medicinal marijuana applied to Parkinson's in this case, if you go on uh, Parkinson Canada's website or even on YouTube, you can access the rerun. Um, so I invite you to uh, have a look at that webinar and it's very, very comprehensive and it's going to show you where are we up to date uh, with that issue. All right, so I think we'll have to move on with our program. I'm sorry, there are many more questions. I invite you either to discuss with us during lunchtime or to keep your questions for this afternoon. There will be opportunities to ask questions after the panel. After the, the conference on uh, physiotherapy, there'll be a panel and there will be a last uh, question period at the end of the day. So please keep your questions. And uh, thank you for um, remaining seated so we can distribute lunchbox. So I want to thank you, Dr. Tejal Patel, for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this worked very well. Yes, we did. I'm looking forward to it because it's